I would say that the Fed's monetary policy will fail or is failing and fiscal policy will fail is in the process of failing even if gold didn't exist if you didn't have gold as a you know multi-millennial monetary standard even if gold wasn't there as a reference point which of course it is but these policies are failing anyway and there are a lot of reasons for that you know whenever i hear you know fiscal stimulus I say, well, no, the Fed can print money all day long and the Congress can spend money all day long, but don't call it stimulus. It's not going to have any stimulative effect. We're way, way past the Keynesian multiplier, which is now below one, meaning if you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, you don't even get a dollar's worth of GDP. You get some numbers, 70, 80 cents. They forget about the multiplier. It's actually now uh, you know, a divide or something that uh, reduces uh, GDP. Well, you don't get the GDP for the borrowing. And same thing with uh, monetary policy, because uh, unlike uh, Milton Friedman, the monetarists, the New Keynesians, the Austrians and everyone else, money printing has nothing to do with inflation. And they, they seem to, well, I don't know if they ever knew it, so I can't say they forgot it. So all the money printing and all the deficit spending will not stimulate the economy. And that's true anyway, but gold is signaling that. Look, all markets are try to be forward leaning. Some do it more successfully than others, more <laughs> accurately than others, but they try. I was I would say that yeah, people say, you know, the stock market is an efficient discounting mechanism for future events, for what they see in the future. And yeah, they look into the future, here's the forecast, they pick out a discount factor, they they present value it and say here's where where stocks should be today based on where things are going to be, you know, six months or a year from now. And that's what they do sort of mathematically and analytically, except they're always wrong about the forecast. You, you got to get the forecast right <laughs> if the discounting process is going to mean anything. So markets go through the process, but they always get the future wrong. They, they're, they're not very good at predictive analytics. So um, this creates what I call the gap between the perception and the reality. Reality always wins, but not right away. Sometimes it takes a while. Gold, on the other hand, as very high predictive analytic value, number one. Number two, it's more forward looking. So gold's kind of telling you where things are going to be maybe a year to 18 months from now instead of six months from now. And so, yeah, so gold is signaling that monetary and fiscal policy will fail and something will else will be tried. Uh, and that ultimately will re, you know, result in a much higher price for gold. So gold's just saying, well, let's do it now. You know, look, I've got gold at $15,000 an ounce by 2025. If I'm wrong about that, it'll be sooner and higher. But that's yeah. well, I, I consider that a conservative forecast. And we can maybe take a few minutes. I go into the analytics behind that. I, as I've said before, you've heard me say I don't I don't just throw numbers out there to get attention. I don't really care. I do care about getting the analysis right. And there's a number of different techniques. And what's interesting is they all point in the same direction. So so you know it's got to go to three thousand before it gets to fifteen thousand. It's got to go to five thousand before it gets to fifteen thousand. So that's my kind of long range forecast but you know it could go down tomorrow and i'm like i don't get depressed when it goes down i don't get euphoric when it goes up i know where it's going in the long run that's the important thing for if you're trying to preserve wealth and make money you know, nothing wrong with making money i'm all for it but uh but sometimes preserving wealth you know risk aversion is a higher priority than just making a lot of money in the short run but uh, either way gold will serve that purpose and uh, you know and preserve wealth over, over that uh, over that time period could it go down tomorrow i guess yeah but all the vectors are pointing up uh, very strongly and i'll give you a, a concrete example there are three things that drive the price of gold fundamentally uh one you've already mentioned which is real interest rates the lower the real interest rate the higher the price of gold number two supply and demand you know you learn it in your first three days in economics but it, it still works uh and then uh, number three is geopolitical risk you know, call it risk off or fear fact, whatever you want to call it, but I, I think of it in geopolitical space. Those three vectors don't all have to point in the same direction. You could have a situation where geopolitical risk is high, pointing to a higher gold price, but real interest rates are, are really high, and that would point to a lower gold price, et cetera. But right now, all three of them are flashing green or maybe flashing gold. The uh, real rates are coming down. Uh, they're still high, by the way. Uh, when, it, when I, I always have to just roll my eyes when uh, like really smart people, uh, Dan Isaacson, uh, Bill Gross, uh, Jeff Gunlock, and I admire them all and I, fo I, I follow them all. But they've, they've all been carried out feet first on this, you know, bond bubble thing, you know, the greatest bond bubble in history and short bonds and the interest rates have nowhere to go but up. They're, they're just failing to distinguish between nominal rates and real rates. Nominal rates are low. Real rates are not low. When I say low, I mean, show me negative 
that's a low real rate. Yeah, you can pick your notes or, or your bills or whatever, but I usually use the 10-year note rate, a uh, 10-year treasury, because it's a good proxy for building construction, long-term investment. People don't borrow overnight to build a building. They borrow for seven years if they can, et cetera. So to me, that's my proxy for, for sort of economic growth and, and inflation forecasting. That's uh, it's about, about 70 basis points today, et cetera. But inflation is, you know, one, one and a half, uh, take your index. So that puts the real rate, you know, maybe negative 25, negative 50 basis points. Well, thank you very much. But, you know, I remind people in 1980, I borrowed money at 13%, but inflation was 15%. And my borrowings were tax deductible. And the tax rate, I lived in New York City at the time, was 50%. So my real after-tax rate was about negative seven. That's a low real rate. So the point is, we have a long way to go. And um, it doesn't matter, you know, people are interested in whether the Fed's going to pursue a negative interest rate policy, take the target rate on Fed funds below zero. Legally, they could. It's already been done in Europe and Switzerland, Japan, and a few other places. I don't necessarily forecast that. I don't think the Fed necessarily wants to go there but you can have negative yield to maturity on a 10-year note just whenever the premium is greater than the present value of the coupons it's a negative yield to maturity so you can get there you can get deeply negative rates in secondary market trading regardless of what the fed does and that will happen and so you know in the dbo one dollar value of one basis point is higher as the absolute level rates gets lower that's just you know duration just bond math 101. So we're going to have huge capital gains in 10-year notes as the yield of maturity goes, you know, towards negative 1%. But that's going to be an enormous boost for gold. Uh, and we're not, we're not even there yet. We're seeing these, uh, we're seeing kind of a spike in gold prices when, they, when real rates are still, you know, relatively high. They're only mildly negative. I was declarative when I said printing money does not cause inflation, and it doesn't. Uh, again, I'll just use the last 12 years as, as Exhibit A. I, we should probably relate to the viewers what does cause inflation. And the answer is velocity, the turnover of money, the lending and the spending. But the problem is velocity is a psychological phenomenon. The Fed can stick the landing on money supply. They can get it down to a couple of decimal places if they want. But if you want to control velocity, which is the key, that's psychological. So, so what you have to do is change the psychology. What is the psychology right now? It's deflationary. Uh, the savings rate in May was 33%. You know, it had it had been going up. It kind of made its way like from 4% to 7%. But then it spiced to 33%. Well, savings is a good thing. You can drive an economy if you can convert savings into investment. And furthermore, if the investment is productive, unlike what China's doing. Uh, but I was, we got some infrastructure or some other projects, R&D, that, that, that would be productive. That can drive an economy. You don't have to drive an economy on consumption. You can drive an economy on productive investment. But the problem is twofold. Number one, it, it has a much longer time frame. That's a five, seven year time frame. And it comes in the short run, at least at the expense of consumption. Our economy is driven 70% by consumption. If you substitute savings for consumption, you're killing velocity. Because if I put my money in the bank and leave it there, the velocity is zero. And I remind people $5 trillion or $6 trillion times zero is zero. You can print all the money you want, but if you don't have velocity, you don't have an economy. And so the question is, how do you how do you change the psychology? How do you get the and by the way, it makes sense to say if you're unemployed, you better be saving because you're maybe lucky if you can pay the rent. Uh, but even people who are working or still have their jobs, they're worried. Maybe I'm next. You know, maybe they fired a the guy down the hall, but maybe I'm next. And so maybe I better save more just in case. You know, and so forth. So, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that doesn't make sense. That makes a lot of sense, but understand what it means. It's deflationary. It reduces velocity. It offsets the increase in the money supply. And it's very hard to get out of. I mean, you know, Keynes called a liquidity trap and he was right. That's what it is. So how do you change the psychology? Well, you need, you need something big. You need something dramatic that's going to get people to say, wait a second, what's going on here? Well, one of them would be a $5,000 price for gold. What do you think is, is, a, is a rational allocation right now for somebody who's at, at, at first and foremost trying not to get destroyed this year? Yeah, and to be clear, I don't give personal financial advice, but at a macro level, I'm happy to talk about what it is. Absolutely. What, None of this is personal financial optimal, advice. Uh, Definitely talk with an advisor, and I'm going to make that plug at the end here, yeah, too. <laughs> uh, portfolio might, might look like. Um, the first thing you say, diversification, the math and the science behind diversification and why it's a good strategy is very clear. That's not much debate about that. The problem is people don't understand what diversification means. They think if they have 50 stocks in 10 sectors, semiconductors, consumer non-durables or whatever, they're diversified. And what I say to them is 
yours, you may have 50 stocks, but that's one asset class. You're in stocks. And then stressful situations, they become highly correlated. So you're not getting the benefit of diversification. You think you are, but you're not. So what does the diversified portfolio look like? Well, I have a slice of stocks. I'm not anti-stock market, but you got to pick the sectors and the stocks that will do, that will perform well, even in the kind of conditions we're talking about. And I would go back to energy, natural resources, agriculture. So, you know, uh, a marathon, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ADM, uh, Cargill, um, uh, you know, uh, mining companies, uh, and not just gold, gold, yeah, but, um, I recently invested in a lithium mine. Uh, I think, I think, <laughs> I think the, the climate alarmists, I think the, I, I, the Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam, uh, and this is a scam, but it doesn't mean it doesn't have legs, whether it's, whether you like it or not. The fact is, uh, it's going to go on. So the lithium's in short supply, uh, graphite, you know, et cetera. So there is a portfolio you can have, which is natural resource oriented that will, uh, do well, even in the kind of tough environment we're talking about. Slug of cash, absolutely. Maybe as much as 30%. I like treasury notes, uh, 10 year treasury notes, but you know, season to taste. If it's, if they're a little too volatile, look at five year notes, two year notes. They're going to come down a lot. Not right away, not tomorrow morning, but, um, sooner than later because of, well, everything we discussed, which is, uh, you know, a uh, recession and uh, interest rates will follow or lagging indicator, but that'll happen. Um, uh, gold, I always recommend 10% slice. Um, hey, hey Jim, real, real quick before we move on from bonds there. Um, so I've talked to a number of analysts and investors, you know, on this program recently who have, who have echoed what you just said there about bonds. And, you know, there are two really good reasons to hold them, right? Three really good reasons to hold them right now. Um, one is just safety, right? This is a time to prioritize safety. Two, they're paying a lot more than they used to pay. So you're getting paid to sit in safety, which is nice. But then they have that, that option value, right? Where if, if, if the, um, Fed does pivot and rates come down, um, yields come down, uh, the actual underlying price of the bond would go up. Right. And so, uh, a number of these guys have said, you know, the bonds, particularly the, the sovereign bonds, especially the U.S. Treasuries, they're looking the best they've seen in, in a long while. And, and, you know, relatively recently, some have said it's like the best I've seen in my career. So I'm just curious, does, do you find that compelling for the moment in time we're in here? Absolutely. There's a, I hate to get too deep in the weeds in terms of bond math, but there's something called a DBO1. DBO1 is the dollar value of one basis point. What that means is, you know, obviously... Basic bond math, interest rates come down, the value, the, the price of the bond goes up. They're just invert, it's a little counterintuitive, but rates come down, the bond goes up. The question is how much? And the lower the interest rate, the more the price of the bond goes up for every basis point drop in rates. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you go from 9% to 8%, you'll have a nice capital gain on your bond. But if you go from 3% to 2%, it's still a 1% drop, but you're going to have a much bigger capital gain. You know, in, in each instance, it's a 1% drop in rates, but the amount of capital gain on the bond is much higher, you know, as the DBO one is higher when the rates are lower. Again, it's all counterintuitive. Yeah, but, but it's sort of like a Richter scale. Each new increment is a much the, higher magnitude. The, 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 the lower the rate, uh, the greater the capital gain on each basis point drop in yields. Yep. That's the basic thing. So yeah, when you're, you're you go from three percent to two percent, that's a home run in terms of capital gains. So you get the yield, you get the safety, you get the liquidity, and if you feel like selling it, you got a nice fat capital gain. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt, but I just thought that was a really important point to underscore. Yeah, I, I agree with the analysts who are saying that. Uh, absolutely. Okay, great. So on to gold, you were saying ten percent ish. Ten percent, but you know, but, yeah, but based on what we were talking about, get. Um, I, I would get, uh, silver dollars, American silver eagles. Yeah. The monster box, uh, you know, a bit of jargon. Monster box comes from the U.S. Mint, it's treasury green, nice shade of green. It comes with a compression strap. I recommend don't open it, you know, unless you know, do, do not break except in case of fire, but inside are 500 one ounce American silver eagles. That's a lot. Um, they'll feed your family for, you know, probably a year. And, uh, it, uh, um, they run, you know, it's, it's a market price, but, uh, you know, be around ten, twelve thousand dollars uh, for a monster box. But to me, it's like battery and flashlights, you know, just have one stick it in a safe place. All right, great. And I'm curious, do you have any uh, particular thoughts on silver versus gold right now? And you're, you're 
2023 yeah, outlook? Yeah, I, I like them both. And, you know, I talk about gold a lot because it's a, a form of money and uh, I do the monetary analysis. Uh, I mean, I do invest in gold mines, but I don't hold myself out as a geologist, but I do think about it from a monetary perspective. And then people always say, Jim, what about silver? What about silver? I'm like, look, if, if gold soars the way I expect, silver's along for the ride. There's, there's no, there's not going to be a world of $3,000 gold and $20 silver. That world doesn't exist. If gold's at 3000 silver's going to be pushing 100 So without giving an exact forecast, uh, silver will be along for the ride. Silver's a little more difficult to analyze because it has industrial applications. Gold really doesn't. Gold's not good for anything except money, but it's the best form of money. Silver can be, is used in a lot of applications. So if you have a recession, it's perhaps the case that the monetary value is going up, but the industrial input value is going down. So it's a little bit more of a mixed bag, but silver is going to do fine. And I do think it's extremely practical because in a world of CBDCs, silver will be a form of spending money. Gold, even the, even the court, even the eight gram coin I mentioned, the quarter ounce American gold eagle, still 500 bucks. It's like pulling a $500 bill out of your wallet. You know, it's, it's a lot for groceries. Right. So, so, so the think of the gold more sort of the store of value and silver more is the, the currency. Yeah, but the quarter ounce, you know, maybe uh, 10 of them gets you a new car or something. So yeah, Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for bigger purchases. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. So that's gold. I, I, I know in the past you've, you've said, hey, you know, real estate, private equity, farmland, et cetera. Those are all things to consider as well. Yeah, um, I think it, still- yeah, yeah, income producing real estate. I wouldn't get into commercial real estate, residential. Uh, yeah, the, the prices are, you know, um, home prices are coming down. Uh, a little more in some markets than others, but uh, if it's income producing and it's solid and it's a, in a place like, you know, uh, some place people want to be like Austin or Phoenix or whatever. I mean, I know that they're, 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 there's markets down a little bit right now, but, you know, it's like buying a, a 10 year bond. You know, it's got steady monthly income and uh, or certainly farmland, uh, but in- income producing real estate, not commercial office buildings should be a part of a diversified portfolio. Yes. All right. Great. Um, I got one last topic uh, I want to talk about with you before I do anything else, just sort of on, uh, actually, let me ask this. So um, we talked there about sort of diversification largely with the eye towards sort of making it through what's coming here. Are there any areas that you potentially think are like, hey, given the events that we see coming, yes, while they're a little scary, there's some opportunity maybe to really if you, if you have some speculative capital, this could be a place that you think could pop really well. Yeah, I mean, I like uh, I, I like private equity, and it's you know you got to credit investor issues and uh, finding good deals and good promoters and good management. But um, you know that, that there are some uh, you know some good deals in the mining sector um, I like, uh, and um, uh, well that, that 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 would be one. I mean, we haven't. We haven't really talked about the important things going on, but we'll maybe do that in another interview. Yeah, that's a pretty good summary. Um, I started uh, my career as a lawyer in the late 70s, but before I went to law school, I got a graduate degree in international economics. So I had that, you know, that macroeconomic uh, background, uh, if you will, even before law. And then after getting out of law school, I worked, I started my career as, uh, international tax counsel for Citibank. So that's about as broad a, um, a platform as you can have. Uh, and then along the way, um, switched into securities and derivatives law, worked for an investment bank, major deal in U.S. government securities. That gave me a pretty good background in federal finance. Um, and then switched to the hedge fund world, um, and was there from start to finish at, long-term capital management, uh, made a few headlines in 1998, and I was the principal negotiator of that rescue by, people say I was rescued by the Federal Reserve, that's not exactly right. The Federal Reserve did convene a meeting of the banks to organize the rescue, but said to the banks, you have to do this. We're, they were sitting in the boardroom at the Fed, kind of hard to say no, but they uh, adjourned over to Merrill Lynch's boardroom a few blocks away on Liberty Street, and we took it from there. And uh, it was one of those deals, you know, five days, no sleep. Everyone's, nobody's shaving. At first, the jackets come off, then the ties come off, then the shirts are unbuttoned, and everyone's got a beard. Nobody slept, but we got it done, brought it in for a soft landing. Um, after that, I ran an electronic stock exchange for a while, uh, but was tapped by the CIA to help them with counterterrorist finance after 9-11 and worked for them for 10 years um, doing uh, this what we did we invented a new branch of intelligence 
called Mark Int for market intelligence, basically getting actionable intelligence from capital markets information, uh, which had never been done before. There's uh, the Int is stands for intelligence, so human Int is human intelligence. SIGINT is signals intelligence. Uh, we invented uh, MarkInt or market intelligence um, that took on life of its own. Uh, and then, f but along the way, um, was uh, just got literally a cold call from a top literary agent. She heard an interview I did on oh, NPR's Planet Money. She's an NPR fan uh, and introduced herself and said, how would you like to write a book? And so I said, I hadn't really thought about it, but let's talk. And we had lunch, hit it off. And then that led to book projects and now, um, you know, seven books and 10 years later, here we are. So either, uh, you can either say I had an eclectic career or I didn't what I wanted to be when I grew up, but I've done uh, a, a little bit of everything from banking, capital markets, hedge funds, um, national security, intelligence, work with the Defense Department, um, and written a bunch of books. Well, it's great to have you here. The first book, which came out 2011, was Currency Wars, the making of the next global crisis. And you certainly touch on a lot of currency dynamics, which are certainly prescient to what's going on today in the latest book, The New Great Depression here. When did you start writing this book? It's just come out in the past week, but it just seems so relevant and timely. I mean, you must have had some pretty fast turnaround on this thing, right? We did. Uh, I, I got the call from uh, my agent, my my publisher, um, late April, and of course, then we were in the thick of uh, the the first wave of infections and fatalities, sadly, and quarantine and lockdown and all that. But and the stock market had just dropped thirty percent, over thirty percent, from um, February twenty fourth to March twenty third. Um, and so they said, we, we, we really want to book on this. It's really important. Um, there's going to be huge interest in this. Uh, and can we do this? And I said, sure. Uh, and our original target day was July 15th. We were trying to come out on July 15th and that's what we worked towards. So, um, I said, I, so basically given the target length and the outline, I was going to write it in about 40 days, 45 days. Um, if you do 2000 words a day, you can get there, but that's a lot of writing. So I said to my wife, well, there's good news, bad news. The, the bad news is for the next 30 days, I'm going to be the most antisocial person you ever met. The good news is we'll have a book behind us and, and we'll get that done. And that's pretty much what we did. I worked really hard straight through and kind of writing in the morning and reading at night and you know, almost like researching uh, uh you know doing the research at night and then waking up the next morning and writing up the research and and other observations and it was all happening very quickly i mean obviously the disease was expanding the economy was collapsing uh but the amount of uh, academic literature on the subject was you, you get, we're getting 10 papers a day coming from all over the place and, and that was good but it was an enormous amount but the um but when I first discussed it with my publisher, they said, well, you know, Jim, we, we think you're great on uh, the economy and capital markets and central banking and all that's really important. And that's what we want you to write about. But keep away from the, you know, the epidemiology and the immunology because you're not, um, you're not a scientist, you're not a doctor. And I said, hold on, um, that's like asking someone to write about property damage in New Orleans in 2005 and not mention Hurricane Katrina. I said, it, it, you can't do that. You, you obviously the pandemic is the catalyst or the cause of the depression and you can't understand one without understanding the other. So I said, I'm gonna do both. I, I teased her a little bit. I said, well, you know, I do, I do have two degrees from Johns Hopkins. So I'm not, uh, I'm not intimidated by natural science. I'm, I'm not a doctor, of course, but, um, uh, I, it's, I'm comfortable in the field. And when I approached it, when I started doing the research, so, so by the way, Alex, this is the first book that deals with both the pandemic and the, what I call the new Great Depression or the economy. Uh, there will be lots of books written on the pandemic. Doctors have already written some, they're out there. Uh, there'll be books written on the economic crash and what's going on. Although it's a funny thing, economists actually don't write that many books. There are some uh, other than textbooks. Textbooks can be huge money makers, kind of boring, but uh, there are a few economists who write books. Paul Krugman does and Barry Eichengreen and a few others, but generally economists prefer to write 
papers, journal articles, monographs and things because it's because they're usually wrong and they're changing it. So you write a paper and you're wrong. Well, just write another paper, you know, um, writing a book, you go out on a limb a little bit because if it's going to have any kind of shelf life, you have to lean forward and and do a little forecasting. And, and I have ways of doing that that are better than what Wall Street and, and Washington do. But um, but you're still at, at, you're you know, you're out on the out on the limb a little bit. Um, but I'm comfortable and, and I've done that before. Uh, but on the, uh, on the medical side of it, um, there were, I read over a hundred peer reviewed journal articles. Uh, obviously, you know, top publications like The Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine and others, but others that, that were top tier, maybe less well known, more specialized. But these papers were coming out, uh, left and right and other evidence was coming out. And when I started, doing the research, I said, well, this is going to be straightforward. There's a bunch of conspiracy theories and fringe theories and just wacky, you know, speculation over here. And there's a lot of good science by reputable uh, clinicians and, and PhDs over here and just kind of discard this and focus on this. And that's what I did. But what I discovered it was easy to discard the junk. But when I got into what I'll call real science, I discovered quickly that the scientists don't agree with each other. Um, I can show you papers that say um, you know, you're, you're a fool to go out without a mask. Masks are the key to this whole thing. Everybody mask up. That's the way we get a handle on the pandemic. I can show you other papers by equally qualified people, PhDs in virology and epidemiology who say, no, masks don't work. The virus is too small. It goes through the weave. Um, they're improperly constructed. We don't wear them correctly uh, and they don't do much good. It's kind of virtue signaling and and, and so, the, but my point is without even taking sides in that, just as a writer, um, uh, and I did present both views and, and all that information is in the end notes. Um, the, the book has over 200 end notes and they're all fairly technical. So I tell people, if you don't like something I said, don't argue with me, uh, go to the, go to the foot, footnotes or the end notes and argue with the, uh, the scientists. But I, I tried to, when there were divisions like that, I tried to represent both sides fairly, but I, I usually do come down on one side or the other based on my own view uh, of the evidence. Um, so that made it more challenging. And then you also have this whole, you know, where did the virus come from? I have a chapter on that. Well, there's the, the wet market theory, which I thought at the time, I thought last spring was um, a lie, basically Chinese propaganda. That's even more apparent today. You have the laboratory theory that it came from a laboratory, particularly the Wuhan Institute of Virology, good evidence that that was the case last spring that's much stronger today a ton of stuff has come in literally in the last couple of weeks bearing that out uh so uh but i that's how i came out in the book i said it did come from the laboratory but that's another area where again i can i can find uh, top scientists with both points of view I, I did learn in reading these scientific journal articles you know there's always an abstract that the authors their affiliations the abstract and then the main paper i would go right to the last page and look at who paid them uh, because they're, you know, modern practices, you disclose your sources of research grant. I, if I saw you were paid by the Chinese, I, I discounted you about 50%. I might've included it, but I, <laughs> I certainly took that into account. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before, and it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was 2007, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good. Goldilocks soft landing. Fed's going to get the memo. They're going to cut rates, the pivot and buy stocks. The bond market is saying, no, this is bad and it's going to get worse and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. But what happens is, as you get closer to the actual thing you're worried about, the inversion gets nearer and nearer. Now it is literally a month away or less interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, as you get close to recession, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, or even medium-sized business businesses. They see it. A lot of business people are living in the real world in real time. They know what's happening now, and the stock market tends to figure it out later. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business heading down, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow while you can, you're like, hey, this is a really bad recession coming. If I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up. Now, 
I don't want my bank changing the terms. I don't want material average change clauses kicking in and said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds. And interest rates go up. And then the recession hits. And the bankers go, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards. They stop doing loss. And then interest rates will start to come down. But interest rates peak after the recession has already begun. So stock market is telling us, Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, here comes Hurricane Mitch, or whatever. And then there's what I call the reality. What I see is kind of a hybrid. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed is probably over-tightened. They're going to keep going for reasons I explained. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. We've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. I don't know. Attention spans seem to be short these days, but it was not long ago. Go back and look at a chart, any stock index chart. From October 1st, 2018 to December 24, 2018, the stock market dropped 20%. I mean, it's like 19.9 or something on the Dow. So maybe not technically a bear market, but yeah, what's the difference? It dropped 20%, culminating in the Christmas Eve massacre, December 24th, 2018, when I think NASDAQ dropped like 3% in one day. one day. Now here's the point. The Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they actually don't care about the stock market. This whole Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that, that's not how it works. They don't care that much about the stock market level. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets, and that's the keyword. Stocks are going down, but it's kind of half a percent a day, 1% a day, trending down. Lower highs, lower lows trending down. The Fed doesn't care about that. They're not going to bail out the stock market. They do care if it's disorderly. When was it disorderly? Well, March 2020, at the worst part of the pandemic, it dropped like 30% in like two or three weeks. The fall of 2008. I mean, it was like somebody opened a trap door. The Fed does care about that because that kind of disorderly behavior can feed on itself and end up in a 1929 type scenario. So the Fed will get the memo, as I put it, stop raising rates and begin cuts when the markets are disorderly, but not just because they're going down. Now, here's what the Fed is missing or maybe everybody's missing. When you hear these layoff announcements, people are like, well, if they're laying off, why isn't the unemployment rate going up? Unemployment lags the business cycle. Unemployment is a lagging indicator. When you're an employer entrepreneur and you're in any kind of no, not as many customers walking in the door, you'll do everything you can to avoid laying people off. Be late on the rent, you'll turn down the lights, find a cheaper laundry, whatever it takes, and then by the time you get around to firing people, you run out of options. I've done everything I can. Now my business is in jeopardy. I have to fire some people. And then combine that with what I just said about severance and rolling terminations, etc. It's a lagging indicator. We know enough right now to know that number is going up this spring, but that's not inconsistent with the fact that we're already in a recession. It's exactly what you would expect, that unemployment is a lagging indicator. Now, having said that, what else is the Fed missing? Well, wages are up 5% on annualized basis. 5.2% on an annualized basis. I'm like, yeah, and inflation is 7% or 6%. So your real wage just went down one or two points because when the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports those wage numbers, those are nominal numbers. I'm not saying they're fake, but you have to know that they're nominal. And you have to subtract inflation to find out what's happening to real wages. And the answer is, real wages have been going down for a couple of years because it runs around 5% annualized, give or take. Sounds like 5% raise. What do you want? Well, yeah, but with 8, 9% inflation, or even 6% inflation, your real wage is going down. So that's not a robust number at all. By the way, the Fed wants to make it worse. The Fed agrees that those wage gains are too high. But my point is, in real terms, they're actually going down, but the Fed wants them to go down more. That would be one way to put it. If you get inflation down and wages are constant, then the real wage goes up relative to where it was before. But if you're unemployed, you have no wage. So that's another issue. Now what the Fed is missing, and it's a long list, but there's something called the labor force participation rate. Now, the labor force participation rate, you just take the number of people working divided by the total working age population. That's all you do. 
It's not sophisticated. And that number today is around 61.2, give or take percent. But as recently as 2000, that number was over 70% and has come down ever since. And it dropped like a stone during 2020. During the pandemic, lockdown came back a little bit, but not much. The reason it got, first of all, it's never 100%. It shouldn't be. There are legitimate reasons to be working age population, not working. You're a homemaker. You're a student. There's a bunch of perfectly good reasons. So it's never 100%, not even close. But 70s is pretty high and 60s is pretty low, and the trend has been down. So that leaves relative to kind of a normalized number. That leaves about 8 to 10 million people between the ages of 25 and 54 who are not in the workforce. There's a big untapped labor pool. But if you took that group and threw it into the unemployment numbers the way the Bureau of Labor Statistics calculates it, unemployment would be about 9%. And that's the depression level of unemployment. Notably in 1980 and 1981, regrettably, analysts anticipate that the recession will surpass expectations, with the bottom potentially falling lower than predicted, perhaps a 30% to 50% decline in the S&P, around 22,100. While we had a brief respite between 2020 and 2023, the situation is worsening in 2023 due to the concurrent financial crisis. The financial crisis is currently brewing, causing widespread panic. If it materializes, the impact will be severe, marking a dark day for America and the world. It's important to note that each financial crisis carries its unique level of impact, ranging from substantial to less significant losses. Predicting the scale and duration of a crisis is challenging, as evidenced by the subprime mortgage crisis from 2007 to 2008, which coincided with a recession, resulting in a disastrous outcome. The expansion of mortgage credit triggered this crisis, enabling widespread borrowing and mortgage acquisition. This mistake led to the collapse of the U.S. housing market, causing many to lose their homes, savings and jobs. The repercussions extended globally given America's pivotal role in world trade. Discussions on recession, inflation and deflation aside, one aspect yet to be addressed, referenced earlier, is the possibility of a global liquidity crisis. In 1998, despite the absence of a recession, the financial world faced a near collapse. Such crises can coincide with recessions, resulting in severe consequences. A notable instance is the subprime mortgage crisis from 2007 to 2008. There's speculation that 2023 might witness a collision between a financial crisis and recession, resembling the 2007-2008 scenario. Financial experts, including Jim Rickards, highlight signs indicating such a development. These signs include a diminishing world trade, daily declines in industrial output coupled with rising unemployment and historically high interest rates for the past 15 years aimed at combating inflation but failing to curb inflated prices. If there are lingering doubts about the recession and financial crisis, examining the recent state of American banks provides clarity. In just a month, five major banks have faced setbacks, such as bankruptcy, EFTIC takeovers and collapses. The combined losses of credit and stockholders from these events surpassed $200 billion, sending a clear signal of systemic issues. Efforts by the EFTIC to reassure the public include unconventional measures, such as guaranteeing depositors sums exceeding $200 billion for Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. These unprecedented actions, while seemingly noble, are predicted by Jim Rickards to deplete the EFTIC insurance fund, ultimately affecting consumers. Moreover, the Federal Reserve's decision to extend more loans to member banks through the Bank Term Funding Program, BTFP, is causing significant turmoil in the U.S. banking system. These moves have intensified public anxiety, particularly among depositors. Concerns arise regarding whether these actions aim to implement new policies or if they are motivated by the interests of a few affected entities. The parallels to the 2008 crisis, where the FDIC guaranteed all bank deposits, echo in current events. As the government faces unrealized losses exceeding $700 billion in U.S. bank portfolios, the continued cash provision to depositors raises concerns about the sustainability of the banking system. The looming question is whether the crisis is truly over, or if the panic is just beginning. Drawing parallels with the 2008 financial crisis, which started a year and six months before reaching a critical stage, the current crisis, only a month old, has already led to the downfall of five banks. Addressing the broader economic situation, 
the FDIC's guaranteeing of all depositors and the Federal Reserve's offer. Of additional loans through BTFP signify pervasive issues. The Fed's guaranteeing of all bank deposits surpassing the $250,000 insurance limit echoes actions taken in 2008 to avert bank runs. However, such measures may strain the FDIC insurance fund with potential consequences for consumers. As the government grapples with increasing unrealized losses in U.S. bank portfolios, the fear is that continuous cash provision to depositors will hasten the collapse of the banking system. Despite attempts to reassure the public, it remains uncertain whether the crisis is truly averted. The interconnectedness of the banking system and the broader economy becomes evident, reflecting a situation that extends beyond individual instances. The Fed's unusual actions, coupled with the FDIC's extraordinary measures, intensify the prevalent challenges. Considering the gravity of the situation, the looming question is, what should one do? How does one respond to the panic and secure oneself against the impending crisis? While the inevitable cannot be avoided, taking proactive steps to preserve wealth becomes crucial. According to Jim Rickards, the first step is acquiring gold. Get down 20% in three months, getting close to crashing. So what happens next? First week of January, pal comes out. Okay, we're not going to raise interest rates anymore. We're going to be patient. They use all these code words. We're going to be patient. Then he starts cutting rates. Then he starts QE. I forget if it was eight or nine, whatever. Lost, lost track of QE. He starts QE eight, let's say. And then that takes you into 2020. And here comes the pandemic. And rates go down to zero. And the balance sheet goes to $7 trillion. They were back where they were in May of 2013 except worse, because now the balance sheet was even bigger than it was then. A complete failure. So who thinks they're going to be more successful this time? They're doing the same thing. It's going to happen faster this time because the market saw that whole seven-year fiasco from May to 2013 to May 2020, a seven-year round-trip failure. The same thing's going to happen, but it's going to happen faster this time because like, the market knows that the Fed doesn't know what they're doing. So the Fed's tightening into weakness. One of two things is going to happen, and it's not clear which, but it's going to be one or the other. They're going to keep tightening and keep tightening and keep tightening, try to get a handle on inflation and crash the stock market. Or they're going to lose their nerve, back off on the tightening, and then inflation is just going to rip, which will also crash the stock market. So take your pick, but um, it's going to be one or the other. But this idea of a soft landing is nonsense. The 2021 thesis was that, you know, inflation grew. Part of it was base effects because, you know, the, the way the government calculates inflation, it's monthly data compared to the year before. So it's year over year, monthly, then annualized. Uh, and so one could easily explain inflation in April, May, June 2021, because you were comparing it to 2020, which was the worst recession since 1946. But the base effects would run off uh, in September, or October, November. But the inflation persisted, even though the base effects were gone. So now it's like, okay, this is real inflation. It's coming from somewhere else. It was coming from the supply chain, which the Fed can't do anything about either because the Fed doesn't drill for oil. They don't build pipelines and they don't grow wheat. The Fed can't do anything about any of those things. And that's where um, the war and the sanctions and the continuation of COVID played a role. So, you know, I just say you can, you can have your own uh, views, but you can't have your own data. The data is clear. The inflation is here. The renowned economist Jim Rickards continued her speech as follows. The supply chains are deteriorating, but these disruptions in the supply chain did not originate with the conflict. They didn't even commence with the pandemic. They initiated with the trade war led by Trump in 2018. I discovered an excellent book on this topic, authored by Luan LaRocco. What's intriguing about her book is that she completed it in late 2019, serving almost as a control experiment. It predates the pandemic. It's convenient to attribute the disruption in the supply chain to the pandemic, which indeed played a role, and the conflict also had its impact. However, we have a meticulous examination of the supply chain's condition before either event, and the conclusion is, it was chaotic. It was chaotic back then due to tariffs on China and China redirecting soybean purchase orders from the United States to Brazil. That may seem straightforward because Brazil cultivates soybeans. Well, guess what? You have to transport the ships to Brazilian ports. You have to reorganize all the logistical lanes. That was already happening. The pandemic exacerbated it, and now the conflict exacerbates it even more. Yes, the world is fragmenting. We're disengaging. Globalization is concluding. 
There will be a new iteration of it, it's not the termination of world trade, but you might witness perhaps the five eyes, UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and allies in Western Europe forming a new trading bloc while excluding China and Russia, it will resemble somewhat the Cold War. I discussed this with Paul B., however, in the 70s, something similar occurred. It commenced with cost-push inflation. It was the Arab oil embargo in 1973 after the Israel-Arab War. Then the Arabs imposed the embargo on us, quadrupling the price of oil from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel. It might sound inexpensive, but that's a 300% increase. Subsequently, we experienced a severe stock market crash and recession in 1974, the most severe since the Great Depression at that time. We've encountered more severe ones since, but back then, it was the worst recession since the Great Depression. Following that, the Fed intervened and Nixon abandoned the gold standard. Nixon implemented an accommodating monetary policy in 72, a bit earlier for his re-election effort, etc. So, here comes inflation, but along the way, and then there was another oil embargo, actually an Iranian oil embargo in 1979 after the Ayatollah took over. So there were dual oil shocks. It was a supply-driven cost-push inflation. However, it transformed into demand pull. It evolved into a demand-side scenario that I lived through. I was a young, up-and-coming lawyer at Citibank, a senior officer living in New York City. That was a time when if you desired anything new, furniture, TV set, vacation, anything, you rushed out. You dropped everything, rushed out, and did it because the price was escalating so rapidly. This is instructive in two ways. Firstly, it illustrates that the Fed is consistently behind the curve. It shows that these issues can persist much longer than anticipated. But more crucially, because I believe things will happen more swiftly now. It demonstrates inflation shifting from cost push to demand pull, transitioning from a supply side matter to a psychological shift on the consumer side. Volcker managed to suppress it, but at a substantial cost. Unemployment reached approximately 11%. He elevated interest rates to 20%. How does that feel? Mortgage holders, student loan holders, and others? 20%, we're talking about 40% on credit cards in that era. People tend to forget, well, doesn't inflation mean you have high growth or whatever? At least low unemployment. No, we had stagflation. We had inflation and high unemployment. There were three recessions between 1974 and 1982. We experienced three in 1974, 1980, and 1981, which persisted until 1982. By the way, people lost confidence in the dollar in the late 70s. Jimmy Carter's treasury issued what they call Carter bonds. The U.S. Treasury issued debt in Swiss francs. Now it was Treasury. Uh, slowing industrial output, uh, slowing retail sales, and importantly uh, for investors, uh, a very sharp decline in inflation. So this is one of the kind of mystifying points about the U.S. stock market. I mean, it seems straightforward to me, but the market has their own dynamic. They're saying, well, um, if the Fed raises rates the way I've described and they cause a recession, the Fed's going to have to cut rates. That's called the pivot, the Fed pivot and lower rates are good for tech stocks or buy stocks. But think about that for a second. What if inflation comes down faster than the Fed thinks? And I think it may, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll return to that. What if inflation comes down really fast uh, and they get to the, the target rate sooner than they think? Um, does that mean they might have to cut? Well, it, it might, but what's good about that for stocks? I mean, if that happens, no one ever says, why did that happen? They just say, well, Inflation may come down, interest rates may come down, so buy stocks. It's like, well, inflation may come down, interest rates may come down, but if it does, it's because we're in a very severe recession, exactly what I'm forecasting. And so if that's the case, stocks are going to plunge, you know, 30, 40, 50%. So don't root for lower rates, or if you're forecasting lower rates, understand what that means. It doesn't mean the Fed chickened out doesn't mean life is wonderful and you should buy tech stocks. It means that we're in the very severe recession that I described, and I think we will end up there, uh, and therefore stocks are going to plunge. So, uh, you know, be careful what you wish for, as they say. Um, my forecast is, yeah, they are going to raise rates. Uh, they're going to over tighten. They're going to cause a very severe recession. Um, and when they do, they may pivot at that time, but it won't be for good reasons. It'll be for very bad reasons, meaning we're in a recession and stocks have plunged. So don't don't buy into the Wall Street chatter as far as uh, as far as that's concerned, because as I say the Fed's going to over tighten. Now, why isn't the Federal Reserve aware of this? Well, because they never are. 
because they have the poorest forecasting record of any institution I can think of. Their entire history since 1913 is one mistake after another, and this will just be the latest in the long series. So, just to kind of recap, the Fed is on a trajectory. We know precisely what it is because they informed us. All you have to do is listen to them and believe them. They're going to increase rates, let high rates do their work, and observe the inflation come down, and maybe in 2024 decrease rates. What I anticipate is they are going to raise rates for the next couple of meetings exactly as I've outlined, but they're going to over-tighten. The signs of recession are already present. The Fed's not looking at them. I'll come back to what they are, by the way. And we'll be in a very severe recession for a lot of reasons. And that's going to mean a plunge in stock prices. So if the Fed cuts rates, don't cheer too loudly, because it'll be in a world where severe recession, higher unemployment, and crashing stock prices are the norm. I'd like to conclude on I can't call it a joyful note, but a global liquidity crisis. Now, I talked about a global recession, and people go, well, isn't that like a liquidity crisis? No, a recession or a depression is very different than a liquidity crisis or a financial panic. They're two different things. They can and do happen separately. In 2008, we had both. In 2008, the recession or depression and a financial panic converged, so they can happen together, but they don't have to. They can happen individually. What we're in for visually looks like a global financial crisis and a global recession at the same time, coming sooner than later. Now why do I say that? There's a global dollar shortage. People go, wait a second, the Fed printed $9 trillion, which they did in 2020. It's come down since then, but they did print that much money. How could there be a global dollar shortage? What people don't understand is that behind the curtain off balance sheet, this is off balance sheet. You've got to go read the footnotes and understand what you're reading. There are one quadrillion dollars of derivatives. And for those not familiar with quadrillion, one quadrillion is a thousand trillion. So, I just said the Fed printed $9 trillion. Maybe it's down to $7 trillion, but you have a quadrillion dollars of derivatives, and they have to be supported with collateral. Not 100%, not even 10%. I mean 1% or 2% is enough. But when you're in a liquidity crisis, banks are extremely choosy about which collateral they'll accept to support this quadrillion dollar inverted pyramid of derivatives. And right now what they're saying because this evolves, it gets worse. It doesn't happen overnight, it can become acute overnight, but it happens over the course of a year or longer. What we see, the banks are saying, I don't want corporate bonds as collateral. I don't want your mortgages as collateral. I don't even want 10-year treasuries as collateral. The only collateral I want are short-term U.S. Treasury bills. Treasury bills have a maximum maturity of one year, 360 days, but there can be four-week bills, eight-week bills, six-month bills, etc. That's the only, that's the best form of collateral. It's the most liquid, easily traded, low volatility, easy to repledge, is by far the best form of collateral. That's all the banks want right now. But if you're a foreign bank, you need dollars to buy the dollar-based collateral. If you want treasury bills that are denominated in dollars, you need dollars to buy the bills. That's why the US dollar is so strong. People go, wait a second, the US has a multi-trillion dollar annual budget deficit, a massive trade deficit, 132% debt to GDP ratio, $31 trillion in debt, you're going into a recession. How can the dollar be so strong? The answer is everything I just said has nothing to do with the demand for dollars in international foreign exchange markets. Countries like Switzerland, Germany, Austria, China, and various Asian nations have maintained a strong affinity for gold. In contrast to the United States, where gold investment is often overshadowed by more traditional financial instruments, these countries have a deep-rooted appreciation for the precious metal. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. They are accelerating their purchases, and I do think it's a sign of things to come. Now, when, when you talk about retail, so you know, everyday investors, Americans, um, I love America, but have kind of given up on Americans and gold. They, they just... Uh, there are, you know, there are people who have positions and, you know, your hedge funds will have paper gold, they'll do gold futures, but the everyday American has been, uh, oh, 40 years at this point of being miseducated on the topic of gold. So they, uh, they're not 
uh, very much integral. You go around the world, you get very different results. You know, Switzerland, Germany, they, they Austria, they love gold. Uh, of course, China, Asian countries, I think Australians have a much better sense than Americans do. So uh, there are the, the buyers of gold, but you say, well, okay, well, who are the big buyers of gold? The answer is the central banks. Now, right there, that should tell you something. So these are the, the most powerful, most plugged in, most heavily monetary institutions in the world. And they're the ones buying gold. Now they would have you believe that gold's not money, gold serves no purpose, you know, it's a, you know, they, the, the, the first ones to say John Maynard Keynes said it was a barbarous relic, which he never said, by the way, he said something, uh, he said that, he said he used the phrase barbarous relic in reference to the gold exchange standard of the 1920s, which was a hybrid gold foreign currency standard, but the foreign currency is not gold. So he said, that's a barbarous relic, but he never said that about gold him, himself. And actually at the end, toward the end of his life, he favored at Bretton Woods, he favored a gold, uh, a global currency called the backward backed by gold. And you know, they're, it's not guesswork, they're papers he published at the time. And that was rejected by the United States, which kind of ran the show, um, partly because our, uh, well, not to get too down, Louise, but our our, our, our undersecretary of the treasury, who was our representative at Bretton Woods was a Stalinist agent. He was a communist. This didn't come out until the 90s after the fall of the Soviet Union when a lot of classified information was released, all KGB files, et cetera. But it was revealed and fully documented in a book by Ben Stile called uh, um, Donald Bretton Woods that he was a communist agent. So what was, he, what was he trying to do by insisting that, by running Keynes's idea off the road, insisting that the US dollar be the anchor? <clears throat> he was trying to destroy the British Empire which he did because he knew that there were far more claims on the Bank of England when they had gold and that would be inherently unstable and that would derail sterling as one of the global reserve currencies and undermine the British Empire, which it did. So um, that's a little, uh, a little bit of a backstory, but it goes to the point that uh, Keynes was, was an advocate for gold at different times in his career and at, and at the end of his career and that when the central banks are buying, I should tell you something. Now, I've said for years, um, you know, I've always pointed to Russia and China. Russia has uh, almost quadrupled their gold reserves in the last 12 years, starting in 2009 through 2020, uh, 2021. They've almost quadrupled, <coughs> pardon me, from about 600 tons to about 2,400 tons. China, the same, uh, not quite, uh, from about 600 tons to about just under 2,000 tons that they report but they're non-transparent. They have a lot more gold than that uh, stashed in uh, something called SAFE, the State Administration on Foreign Exchange, which is a secretive Chinese sovereign wealth fund run by an ex pinco guy, by the way, he knows what he's doing. Um, and they, they're non-transparent. So the People's Bank of China is kind of transparent. SAFE is non-transparent. The crux of Jim Rickard's argument lies in the behavior of central banks, the most powerful and influential monetary institutions globally. Rickards highlights that central banks, including those in Russia and China, have been steadily increasing their gold reserves over the past decade. Russia, for instance, nearly quadrupled its gold holdings from 2009 to 2021, while China, although less transparent, has also significantly boosted its gold reserves. What is particularly telling about central banks' interest in gold is that they are the custodians of monetary policy and are deeply ingrained in the global financial system. Rickards argues that their preference for gold should not be dismissed as mere nostalgia for a bygone era when gold was the primary backing for currencies. Instead, it reflects a strategic decision to safeguard their wealth and financial stability in an ever-evolving economic landscape. Jim Rickards dispels the notion that gold is an outdated relic, as some critics argue. He points out that even renowned economist John Maynard Keynes, often cited as a critic of the gold standard, had different perspectives on gold throughout his career. Keynes indeed criticized the gold exchange standard of the 1920s, but he later advocated for a global currency backed by gold. So every uh, six, seven years, what you'll see is the People's Bank of China will announce, oh, we've increased our gold reserves by 400 tons or 500 tons or whatever as the case may be. And well, it sounded like they went out the night before and bought 600 tons. You know, good luck trying that, you can't do it. Well, what it means is that that SAFE took some of the, the hidden gold that they had been acquiring slowly and in an accounting entry moved it over to 
the People's Bank of China and boom, there's 500 tons overnight. But of course they had it all along and they still do. So they probably have more. So Russia and China are big acquirers again, triple and quadruple in their gold reserves. But now we're seeing it in a lot of other countries. Um, uh, in the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Mexico, uh, Iran is a major buyer, but non, non-transparent. Turkey has drastically increased its gold reserves. These are, these are major countries uh, and they're, they're adding. So, so I look at that and there's, there's very good data from the IMF and the World Gold Council, so you can find this information. But the one that was just like not doing anything was Japan. They had about 600 tons, but they had 600 tons for 30 years. I went back and looked at all the old data. It was like 30, never, that was boring. Who cares about Japan 600 tons? And then just about, um, at this point, about six months ago, so late last summer, um, they bumped it by, uh, I believe it was, it was 50 tons, perhaps more. I look at the exact number, but it was over 50 tons overnight. It just went from, you know, 600 tons to 650 tons, just like that. Well, here's what you know. Same thing I said about Russia. You can't buy 50 tons overnight, or not, you couldn't even do it in a month. I mean, the the dealers would be working the order, it would be disrupted to the market. It would show, it would leave a lot of fingerprints, put it that way. But what it tells you is two things. Number one, Japan had the gold all along. They had it in some sidecar or side account or Ministry of Finance hidden account, what as the case may be. And they chose to move it over to their reserve position, which they can do. That's an accounting entry. But they had to have they had to have had the gold all along, because you can't buy that much that fast. So then that begs the question: Well, why all of a sudden? Why now, after decades of holding your gold level constant, do you all of a sudden step up in a big way? Um, a lot of possible answers to that. One, you know, China's making noises about invading Taiwan. Well, if you're going to invade Taiwan, why not invade Japan while you're at it? It's just another chain of islands as far as the Chinese are concerned. Rickards emphasizes that the misinterpretation of Keynes' views on gold has perpetuated the misunderstanding of the precious metal's role in the modern financial system. In doing so, he underscores that gold has historically played a vital role in global monetary systems and its significance should not be underestimated. As central banks continue to accumulate gold reserves, the question arises, why? Jim Rickards suggests several reasons. First, gold serves as a hedge against the US dollar's potential devaluation due to inflation or loss of confidence in central bank currencies. Second, it can act as a buffer in times of economic crisis and geopolitical uncertainties. Rickards also speculates that the actions of central banks like Japan which recently increased its gold reserves significantly, could be driven by concerns over the reliability of the United States as a geopolitical ally. The aftermath of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan has left many nations questioning their dependence on U.S. protection, leading some, like Japan, to fortify their financial and military positions. And after and this happened right around the time, maybe shortly after um, the U.S. debacle in Afghanistan, which was, you know, the worst foreign policy uh, military disgrace, humiliation in U.S. history that I can remember. I don't know how far you'd have to go back to find a worse uh, turn of turn of events, um, and and that there it was. Well, all of a sudden, allies all over the world, you know, Israel, um, Japan, Taiwan, they're questioning the United States. Like, hey, we're, we, we thought you're un we're under your nuclear umbrella. You stand by us too thick or thin. Here, you leave Americans behind enemy lines. So, um, so perhaps, now this is speculation, but perhaps Japan sees the threat to Taiwan, feels they may be in the, in the sights of the Chinese, feels the United States may not be as reliable as one had thought, and says, well, we have to, we now have to step up a little bit financially, militarily, et cetera, and they're doing that. But, it, but that aside, that's a little geopolitical speculation, but that aside, the gold is real. They put it on the books. So the biggest buyers of the gold in the world are the central banks. By the way, from 1970 to 2010, central banks were net sellers. Now some bought and some sold, but on, on net they were net sellers. We had Brown's Bottom in 1999 when the UK sold half their gold at the lowest price in uh, about 60 years. <laughs> they, they, they literally hit the bottom at about $200 an ounce, to give or take. Um, but um, but since 2010, central banks in the aggregate have been net buyers, and that buying is accelerating. So what does that tell you? 
It tells you that the most knowledgeable players in the world are adding gold to their reserves because they consider that a prudent hedge to the U.S. dollar, if you have U.S. dollar inflation, or to uh, collapse the confidence in uh, central bank currencies generally, um, or they're just saying, hey, we're, we're, we're part of the club. Uh, by the way, here's a good uh, trivia question for you, uh, Shea. If you're, you know, if you're in, a, in a bar and with a lot of brainy economists around, uh, ask them, uh, bet, them, bet them a drink on this. Ask them what percentage of U.S. reserves are in gold. The, the answer in China is about 2%. Uh, Russia is about 20%. Um, you know what the percentage is for the United States? It's got to be 0.5%. Se- 70, 75%. 75%. 75%. The U.S. does not rely on euros and Nazi dollars and Canadian dollars for its reserve position. A little bit, um, but um, 75% of U.S. reserves are in gold. So don't let don't let any central banker, don't let uh, Jay Powell or Johnny Allen or any of these others tell you that gold's not a monetary asset. We have the largest gold stash in the world, and 75% of our reserves are in gold. So that's the U.S., uh, you know, as, as they say, uh, uh, watch what they do, not what they say. It's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks, and and other asset classes. So uh, yeah, I do. Uh, that, that is my. If you're Argentine and you're borrowing dollars and you print pesos, how are you going to pay the dollars back unless you have you know huge trade surpluses, which they don't? So they just default. You know, Argentina is a serial defaulter, and everyone expects that. If you borrow in dollars and you print dollars, which the United States does, they're like, what's the problem? Just print the dollars and pay the money back. Well, that's true. If you print dollars, there's no reason to default on dollar debt because you actually can print the money and buy the bonds. But it doesn't mean nothing else bad happens. What about inflation or hyperinflation? What about a foreign exchange rate? You know, the exchange rate can collapse. And these modern monetary theorists show very little understanding of the international aspects. They treat the U.S. like a closed economy, which it's not. If it were a closed economy and we didn't have to worry about trade deficits, trade surpluses, capital flows, exchange rates, you know, foreign credit, you know, China owning one trillion dollars of U.S. Treasury securities, which they do. If you didn't have to worry about any of that, I think they'd probably still be wrong, but they'd have a better case. But you do. She says, well, we don't really need a bond market, a U.S. bond market. We only have a bond market as a favor to investors because it gives them a place to put their money. They say when inflation happens, raise taxes. By the way, they also say you don't need a tax system because if you can just print the money, why do you have to collect taxes? And their answer is we collect taxes to redistribute income. Okay, well, at least they're honest. I mean, that's kind of a socialist model, but they're honest about it. If you ask the typical member of Congress to find modern monetary theory, they'll look at you funny. They've either never heard of it or they certainly don't know what it means, MMT, you know. They're acting in accordance with modern monetary theory. Whether they know it or not doesn't matter. The actual behavior, let's go back to COVID, as we talked about the debt to GDP ratio. So Trump put through a $2 trillion COVID relief package. And that was when, you know, the Paycheck Protection Plan, that was $800 billion, and everyone got the $1,200 check. And then at the end of December, at the very end of the Trump administration, they did another trillion dollars almost. And that's when everyone got the $600 checks. And now you're up, up to $1,800. By the way, those checks, that is helicopter money. What the Fed does is nonsense. But when it's fiscal policy, not monetary policy and you're handing out checks that is helicopter money and credit to Larry Summers for saying you're going to get inflation out of this well Biden comes into office in January 2021 and he's like not to be outdone he did his own COVID relief package that was another two trillion dollars and that's when we all got the fourteen hundred dollar checks they just handed them out and then later that year they did the trillion dollar infrastructure package and then, just to top it off, what we get recently was the uh, just under a trillion dollar Green New Deal, I call it the Green New Scam. And the baseline budget deficit, before everything I just described, the baseline budget deficit was about a trillion dollars a year. So take a trillion dollars for 2020, 2021, add on you know, two trillion for Trump's first package, one trillion for his second one, 
2 trillion for Biden's first package, 1 trillion for the Green News scam, and I think a trillion for infrastructure. That's $7 trillion on top of the $2 trillion baseline budget deficit. So that's $9 trillion piled on top of what was at the time about a $21 trillion national debt. So that's how we got to 30 trillion. That's how the ratio went from 106 to 131. These numbers are mind boggling and MMT says it doesn't matter. But it does matter and it shows up the way I described earlier, which is it slows growth. You don't get growth. So best case for the U.S. is very slow, weak growth, which we saw up in 2009 to 2019. Worst case is you throw a recession on top of that, which we're heading for, and the U.S. will be in fiscal distress. If we're on the verge of a global liquidity crisis, as revealed by the euro dollar futures curve and the treasury yield curve and, you know, uh, negative swap spreads and uh, treasury bill auctions with the yield of maturity below what the Fed will give you for a phone call. I mean, all those things are happening. That's hard data. Uh, and it's a very, very troubling sign, less seen in 2008, by the way, before the, two, before the Lehman Brothers meltdown. If all that's happening and the fundamental signs are also weak, which we just saw in third quarter GDP, which is based on net exports, which won't last. How, how are you going to drive a trade surplus with, with the strongest dollar in 20 years? Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. So with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? We're putting up inflation numbers today that are the highest in 40 years. That is correct. A little 41. Uh, actually, it was 1981 before we saw these numbers. But I remind people, the inflation in 1981 was the end of a 10-year period of inflation. It wasn't the beginning, but it had started. I mean, in some ways it started in 1968 and it really took off in 1974-75. So 81, these numbers, that was when Volcker finally got it under control. But you go back to 80, 70, you know, 70 well, between 77 and 81, so that five-year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power. Not 15, 50. Uh, in that five-year stretch. So you were putting up numbers, you know, 10%, 11%, 13% and higher year after year. Yeah, 1981, it was, um, you know, nine or 10, which is what they're comparing it to today. But that was, I was on the downslope. It had been higher than that in 77, 78 and 79. So the question is, is this the beginning of an inflationary surge where it's going to get even worse and it is going to last five years? Is it different than that? But keep that in mind because the, the 40 year comparison, it is correct, but that was the tail end of an even worse episode third quarter was a lot stronger, 2.6%. But when you dissect that, what you see is that that was almost 100% driven by net exports. When, when was the last time the United States had positive GDP driven by net exports? Probably 1959. I mean, that's that's typically a drag on growth and we, we run a, we've been running trade deficits forever. That meant that people were still buying U.S. goods, but the U.S., we were not buying as much from other people. That's indicative of a slowdown. Consumption was weak. Private investment was weak. Inventories were weak. Those are the real drivers of the economy and they were all weak. So okay, net exports, that's not sustainable. So I would look for a recession, a more severe recession to begin in the fourth quarter. That's one, you know, combined with Fed tightening, interest rate hikes, balance sheet reductions, et cetera. That's one whole vector. And I wouldn't put any weight on a low unemployment rate. It ignores labor force participation rate, which is awful. You know, it's down around 62% versus 70% in the year 2000. But beyond that, unemployment is a lagging indicator. Unemployment goes up after a recession begins. Employers are very reluctant to lay off employees. You got to pay severance. Um, you, it, it's expensive to recruit and hire them back and train them. So you, you, you pretty much wait until the recession has already started and you can, oh, gee, all right, I got to lay some people off. So it's not a leading indicator, it's a lagging indicator. So the Fed is behind the curve. There is a brewing global liquidity crisis, a global financial crisis that's different from a recession. It's, uh, financial panics and recessions are two different things. They can come separately. In 1998, we had a financial panic, but there was no recession. In 1990, we had a recession, but there was no financial panic. In 2008, we had both. They, they can come together. It looks like they might be coming together again. This is revealed in uh, inverted yield curves. Um, major dealers are bidding at auction for treasury bills. Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world, you know, 1929, US, 1989, Japan, 2000, dot com stocks, you know, and, and many others. And he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's a triple greatest bubble of all time, times three, in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks, and, and other asset classes. So, uh...
as if one of our supply chains or one of another country's supply chains that we rely on collapsed, it could cause an unprecedented economic super collapse on a global scale. And that's how we could end up with this $85 trillion economic super collapse I'm predicting. $85 trillion being the value of the global economy. Because remember, our current supply chain is interconnected on a global scale. And if there is a single point of failure, the whole system is going to come collapsing down. Farming, banking, healthcare, oil and gas, tech, and so on. This isn't the first time I've warned Americans about this before. On May 11, 2020, I told my followers, the economy will not return to normal for years. There are serious constraints on supply. I issued another warning about my research on November 24, 2021. The supply chain difficulties will certainly grow worse. The remedies will take years and sometimes decades to implement. And yet another in 2022. Don't believe the happy talk about a temporary supply chain crisis. I'll say that again. The crisis will last for years with predictable negative effects on economic growth. But now things are even worse than ever before. And I fear this economic super collapse could hit American soil in the next 6 to 12 months. So this may be my last and final warning before it's too late. It's why I'm warning people around me it's only a matter of time before the world economy comes crashing down. Because when you talk about risk of catastrophic collapse, the risk increases with the size of scale. Look, whether you decide to listen to me today about how to prepare, whether or not you decide to get access to the information in this envelope, that's up to you. It's a free country. You can do what you want. You can even pretend you never heard me tell you any of this. But just know, Joe Biden certainly isn't going to come to your rescue. Take a look at this nine second clip from the president. When do you think things will get back to normal? When do I think things will get back to normal? But my hope is by this time next year, we're going to be back to normal. That clip was taken over 18 months ago. It's up to you what you believe, but I can't bury my head in the sand and ignore all the facts. And the facts couldn't be more clear. So in just a moment, I'm going to explain how you can get access to this information inside the envelope as part of my super collapse preparation package. I'm going to talk about what to do to protect and even grow your wealth. Look, please understand, it brings me no joy to say this, and I hope the worst of what I'm warning of never comes to pass. But there's only one potential solution to this crisis, and it's going to take years. Recently, I spoke to a very well-informed CEO of a major corporation, and I asked him point blank. I said, your company must be looking ahead of some possible solution. Is there anything you can share? Well, I'm going to tell you the same thing he told me. He said, Jim, you have to understand that it took us 30 years to build these supply chains. We blew it up in three years, beginning in 2018, and you can't put it back together. But there is one thing we can do. It's not a quick fix, but it's our best and most sensible option. Our only way out is to build a new supply chain that eliminates the bad actors. We can't continue to allow our enemies like China or Russia or Iran to threaten consumers here on American soil. As the Wall Street Journal wrote, Russia's lengthening war with Ukraine will lead to a near doubling of inflation rates in rich countries. It's why the New York Times wrote, this is what happens when globalization breaks down. And why Barron's wrote, secure U.S. supply chains with allies and move out of China. Unfortunately, this solution could take years or even a decade to fully implement. And that CEO told me it will take at least 10 years to reconstruct the supply chains if we don't want to do it with China and globalization. But whether you realize it or not, that's the bet we're making as a nation. It's happening now. And when the dust settles, we're either going to have rolled out this new supply chain before a worst case scenario happens, or we're going to face whatever lies ahead from this $85 trillion economic super collapse. Now, maybe you're wondering how bad things could really get. Let me answer that question with another question. Do you remember your life at the beginning of the pandemic? Despite all of our freedoms we all hold so dear, an unelected official with the ear of the president recommended immediate lockdowns. And suddenly we heard demands like shelter in place or stay at home, backed up by the threat of arrest. Large swaths of the economy ground to a halt. Looting took over our towns and cities. Because so many businesses were shut down, people were emboldened to take to the streets. But if most Americans don't have access to enough food, water, or other necessary supplies, do you really believe our streets and our businesses won't see more violence? It's why gun sales keep hitting all-time highs as more and more Americans prepare for whatever lies ahead. And while I hope the worst of what I'm warning in my urgent new book never comes to pass, I don't suggest you rely on hope to protect yourself and your family. I'm certainly not. Here's how I'm ensuring my family's well-being. First, I would suggest stocking up on essentials, just like I've done. 
I have a fully finished area in the basement of one of my properties, the address of which I keep totally private. It provides me with a warehousing area for months' worth of canned foods and other non-perishable provisions. That's important. Don't stop with a three-day supply like the CDC recommends. Make sure you have enough water, basic food, and toiletries to last at least three months, and keep them in a safe area where they can sit without damage or spoiling. I would also recommend buying several large capacity freezers. I already have three and I may continue purchasing more. If you have the means, consider installing alternate energy solutions in case of a worst case scenario. I've already installed the largest non-commercial solar power system in New England on my property. If you can, have alternative sources of power generation on your property. I've also dug three wells, planted abundant gardens, and built a significant greenhouse. But whatever you decide, do recognize that none of it will matter if you're not getting accurate information about what to expect in the coming days. Like I said, to be able to make the right decisions during a crisis, you need to lean on someone. So if that's not me, you should find another well-connected person you can trust, ideally someone who's previously held a position of power in our government. But if you want to learn what's inside this envelope and see what I know, right now is your chance. See, I've gone ahead and published this information I'm holding here in this envelope inside my newest book. It has brand new proof of the unfolding situation and inside level details on how it will play out. Urgent preparation report number one. Buy this asset after securing your family's food and energy. As the economy collapses and the shelves are bare, the government will respond by printing even more money. When it does, the value of the dollar will be destroyed through inflation. But 5,000 years of history proves that one item, gold, outlasts every other currency as a form of money. And I believe that economic collapse occurring right now will send gold skyrocketing over the next six months. That's why I'll send you my urgent report called The Perfect Physical Gold Portfolio. Everything you need to know about buying the right kind of physical gold as part of my super collapse preparation package. You'll find everything you need to know about investing in gold before the price blasts through the ceiling, including is gold safe to invest in? How much should I invest in precious metals? What metals should I buy and what should I avoid? What are the best places to buy gold and other precious metals? What are the safest ways to store gold to avoid theft or government confiscation? And much more. Plus, I'll also send you urgent preparation report number two, my Biden Bucks protection plan. I haven't mentioned it yet, but during my research, I came across a troubling executive order that President Biden just signed. See, every time there's an economic crisis, the government responds with massive new programs to try and control the economy and its citizens. In 2008, it was bailouts of big banks and new government agencies to regulate the financial industry. This time, it will be much worse. I've uncovered a plan for U.S. government cryptocurrency I call Biden Bucks that I believe the government will unveil during this economic collapse to control your money and manage the societal fallout. By the time this program is announced, it will be nearly impossible for everyday Americans like you to protect their wealth and keep their privacy which is why I've created another urgent report to get you prepared ahead of time. Inside this new report, you'll get step-by-step details on what these Biden bucks are, why they'll be used during this collapse, and how to outsmart the sinister program. By creating one, an off-the-grid fortune, secure $1.1 million in wealth inside a soda can safe. Two, saving your freedoms, have liquidity and spendable wealth without using Biden bucks. And three, growing your personal wealth, you'll get possible investment upside as events unfold. And four, ensuring you maintain your wealth regardless of external conditions. Building your own off-the-grid portfolio now will protect you from the government surveillance state coming during the economic super collapse. Biden bucks testing is underway. The digital dollar could be rolled out soon. Before it's too late, make sure to protect yourself and your retirement savings. You'll find everything you need in this urgent report as part of my super collapse preparation package. But that's not all because you'll also get urgent preparation report number three. Secure this secret off the grid asset. You see, I've learned of another little appreciated asset that's a liquid form of wealth. It can't be tracked or traced. It's completely legal and easy to find if you know where to look. Over time, its value has steadily grown, but very few people know anything about its investment potential. You're about to be one of the few. I believe you must include this secret asset in any off the grid portfolio. Uh, what's coming is a very severe recession. The uh, uh, you know monetary tightening uh, on top of a world where growth is deaccelerating, inventories are sky high, 
you know, the funny thing about the supply chain is you go back a year or so, kind of this time last year, we all remember headline, you know, supply chain is broken down, uh, you know, the, the shelves are bare. So well, all true, that, that was happening at the time. And that's when I uh, started working on the book. But what a lot of purchasing managers did um, and inventory managers, they they doubled their orders. They said, well, we're tripled the orders. They said, well, if the supply chain's breaking down and I want just a normal amount, I better order three times as much or twice as much just to get what I want. And they did. Well, what happened was by the summer, some of that pressure had been alleviated. And here come the shipments into the warehouses that are twice as much or three times as much as what you needed at the exact same time that the Fed was destroying demand. And so demand drops off a cliff. Uh, retail sales drop off a cliff. The warehouses go from being empty to being full to the rafters. And now all that merchandise is sitting there. So, uh, you know, Nike, I mean, just many examples. So what, are, what do you do when you're um, in charge of inventory? You cut prices. You, you don't want that inventory. It costs a lot of money to keep it in the warehouses, number one. Number two, a lot of it's seasonal. It's like who wants to buy, you know, a summer dress in uh, December? There are not too many people. Um, so they just slash prices, uh, and that reduces margins and reduces profits. So we're just kind of flying into the face of all that. Uh, with the Fed tightening rates into weakness, the, the Fed will be the last to know because they're very model driven and the models are badly flawed, mostly with the Phillips curve and their focus on the unemployment rate, which uh, is is not a good measure of um, of what's going on in the labor force. So we're flying into a really bad recession. The stock market is starting to get the message, but you know, you've got this pivot narrative. You can't quite get rid of the Some of the buy the dips people are still around. So Count on them to, you know, buy into a, what could be a horrendous bear market. Uh, you got your buy and hold crowd. You know, remember in uh, 2000, 2001, the Nasdaq dropped 80%. And a lot of people got out, but a lot of, they said, well, just hold on to it. Well, it did come back, but it took until 2015. I mean, it took, that's a long time. A lot of people died in the meantime. You know, you're waiting 14 years to get back to where you were. So, uh, so those people are still around, but there is what I call the pivot crowd. So the Fed pivot is a narrative, and it kind of goes like this. Yeah, the Fed's tightening. We see that. Inflation is going to come down really fast. The economy is going to slow down really fast. Both of those things are happening. Inflation, a little less so, but the economic slowdown is there. And the Fed's going to get the wake-up call and have to cut rates. And cutting rates, that's the pivot. They're going to pivot from rate hikes to rate cuts. And that's good for tech stocks, so buy stocks. Now, that's the narrative. It prevailed in uh, late July and most of August. The stock market did go up. There was a, there was a decent rally uh, in the middle of what's you know, become a, a bear market uh, based on this Fed narrative that they were going to have to cut rates. There are two huge fallacies in that, uh, in that narrative. The first one is, uh, who says the Fed's going to get the message? And if you look at what Jay Powell said and what he repeated, we're going to raise rates. We're going to crush uh, inflation. Uh, you know, I've been following this for 50 years. I've, I've never seen a Fed chairman use the word pain three times in one paragraph, but he did. Um, uh, and he meant it. Um, he knows there's going to be a recession. They're causing it in, in part. Um, unemployment's going to go up. He said that he tied unemployment to, um, killing a, you know, basically demand destruction and getting inflation under control. He said, we're, that's how we're going to do it. Um, and, uh, you're already starting to see some early signs of that. So with that as their focus, who says the Fed's going to, you know, get a wake up call? Almost certainly not. I mean, they told us what they're going to do. They're going to raise rates. And then he said, if we see progress on inflation, we'll pause. But pause doesn't mean cut. It means just wait a long time because at that point, core PCE, that's personal consumption expenditure, core, which excludes oil and food. And that, that's just how they do it. That's their favorite metric. You can debate whether it's the best one, but it, the debate doesn't matter because that is the one they use. Um, that let's say that comes down to around three and a half. Okay, it's still not two. Now, what pal, which is their target? So, what pal said is we don't have to keep raising rates to force it to two. We just have to raise them enough that it'll get to two on its own. That's what they call a restrictive or restrictive policy. So, but that's not a rate cut. That's that he said that might last for a year all the way into 2024. That's when he was talking about rate cuts. Now, again, this, this can change, but, but they've told us what they're going to do. I always say forecasting the Fed is the easiest thing I do because they actually tell you what you're going to do, what they're going to do. You just have to listen and believe them. Um, now, the hard part is understanding 
how badly they're going to destroy the economy and when they're going to get the wake up call. That's the hard part of the analysis. But telling what they're telling you what they're going to do is the easy part because they kind of tell you. So so the stock market notion that somehow there'll be cutting rates is just false. And but the second fallacy is even bigger is tell me why it's a buy signal for stocks if the Fed is throwing the economy into such a bad recession that unemployment is going to go up significantly and growth is going to come down and inflation is going to come down. Why is that a, a, a buy signal for stocks? Maybe at the bottom, you know, and the bottom might not be till late 2023. Okay. Yeah. There's, there are opportunities to, to buy the bottom, but we'll be nowhere near the bottom. Bear market rallies are, are really interesting. Some of the biggest rallies in history have been in the middle of bear markets where you ended up losing everything, but for a couple of days or weeks, even, uh, uh, it's hey the bottom's in and you buy stocks etc. So you have you have to watch out for that. So so my expectation is the recession's coming. It's going to be really bad. Um, Inflation is going to come down fast, but not quite fast enough for the Fed. Uh, they're going to keep raising rates, destroying demand, raising unemployment, and we're going to wake up with a, a severe recession, high unemployment, and a much lower stock market. I. Uh, yeah, I was around for the 2008 financial crisis. I was around for 1998 financial crisis. You know, I, I, I negotiated that uh, bailout for LTCM. Uh, 98 was interesting because it was a an acute financial crisis that came very close within hours. Actually, you know, I was you know I was in the room with the Treasury and Italian Finance Ministry and 19 banks and you know a thundering herd of lawyers trying to trying to save the world. But uh, we we came within hours of shutting every market in the world. It was a four billion dollar all cash. You know, you could you couldn't use the word due diligence because there wasn't time. It was just, hey, the Fed wants us to do this, so let's just do it. Um, so uh, so that worked, but um, it was it was you know it was a very close call. They would have shut down Tokyo and then around the world, London and finally New York. And yeah, they would have opened days later, but that's how uh, with trillions of dollars of losses, it would have been worse than what actually happened in in two thousand eight. It didn't happen. But there was no economic recession at the time. That was, and that's, that confuses a lot of people because, and particularly if you're, if you're using 2008 as a frame of reference, there are, there are financial panics and financial crises and liquidity crises, and there are recessions, some of which are severe. But they're two different things. Uh, 98 was a finan- an acute financial crisis with no recession. Um, 2000 was a mild recession, but there was no severe financial crisis. Now, NASDAQ collapsed, but there wasn't a lot of leverage in NASDAQ. There was no contagion there, but it didn't spread because it didn't, no banks, no banks failed, no major brokerages failed, et cetera. Uh, so, so in 1990, a mild recession, but no financial panic. Uh, October 19, 1987, interesting stock market fell 22% in one day. Not a week or a month, but one day down 22%. And that was a financial crisis, but there was no, there was no recession. Uh, so they're separate things. However, they can happen together. And 2008 was an example. There we had both, but I would encourage analysts to separate those two things. Again, they came together. It was, it was horrific, but, um, but they can happen separately. My, my point is we may have. Um, a very bad recession, possibly worse than 2008. But 2008 is a model, and that may be what we're heading for, bearing in mind that these are two separate vectors. Hey guys, welcome back to Nifty Invest. In this video, Jim Rickards discusses the relationship between interest rates and the business cycle, and the different indicators that suggest an economic downturn may be on the horizon. He notes that interest rates are a lagging indicator, and that business owners, entrepreneurs, and medium-sized businesses are often the first to notice when a recession is imminent. He also points out that while the stock market is predicting a soft landing, the bond market is signaling that a recession is coming, and that the inversion of yield curves is a particularly worrisome indicator. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. The uh, interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates be um, you know, going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, um, as you get close to recession, who, who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know 
Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, um, or even medium-sized businesses. Um, they see it. Uh, uh, you know, if you're in the trucking business, it's it's real time. Uh, you know, if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed, you're not you're not moving anything by truck. Uh, so there are certain businesses that are concurrent. But the, the stock market is saying, uh, yeah, the Fed's raising rates, inflation is coming down, but we think they're already at the terminal rate. But not only that, we think they're going to get the memo that, that the Fed will figure that out uh, before they get to five and a quarter, before they raise rates in May, maybe even March, you know, maybe they're done. Um, and because of a recession, uh, this is these soft landing Goldilocks scenario where the market's right, the Fed's wrong, but the Fed will realize that the market's actually right and cut rates, you know, and if you're gonna cut rates, buy stocks. That's like, Wall, Wall Street always ends every analysis with buy stocks. If you listen to you know, Michael Berry, uh, Jeremy Grantham, uh, you know, Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they, they run, uh, you know, hundreds of billions uh, and uh, they're saying the same thing. So Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at, bubbles all over the world you know 1929 us 1989 japan 2000 dot-com stocks you know and and many others um and he said he's never seen anything like it you know it's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um real estate stocks and and other asset classes so uh yeah i do uh, that that is my view but it's it's shared by a number of other analysts 1929, yeah, everyone was like, yeah, October, uh, I think uh, 18th or 19th, it was late October 1929, the stock market fell 22% in two days. It wasn't one day, it was, you know, it was like 12% one day, 11% the next day, so 23% over two days. But that wasn't the crash. I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. The, the, this, this Dow Jones fell 82%. From, from top to bottom. Now it took three years. It, it bottomed in uh, June 1932, uh, started in October 1929, so not quite three years, but uh, that fell 82%. And and that happened. So, uh, so yeah, we're down, uh, you know, NASDAQ's down, uh, bounced back a little bit in recent days, down close to 30%, down the S&P down over 20%. We're in bear market territory, but that that's just the beginning. That's not what a full, bear market, full, you know, market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that I expect. Jim Rickards explains that interest rates are a lagging indicator and that people like to question how they could go up if we're in a recession. However, as we get closer to a recession, business people like entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, and taxi drivers are the ones who figure it out first, not the Federal Reserve or Wall Street. The stock market might say that the Federal Reserve is raising rates and inflation is coming down but it might not be the case. The bond market is telling a completely different story, by the way, and, and this is a little more esoteric, uh, but uh, if you look at um, yield curves, look at the treasury yield curve, euro dollar futures yield curve, German bunds, they're all inverted. They're all inverted. Now, inversions happen, just meaning the longer term rate is lower than the short term rate. Now this is in the treasury yield curve. They're inverted from one month to 20 years. It's not like, you know, talk twos and fives and fives and tens and one month, one, a one month bill is yielding more than a 20 year note. Okay, that's inverted across the entire yield curve. Um, the Euro dollar future, same thing. The inversion kicks in. Uh, it doesn't kick in immediately because the Fed does control very short term rates and they're raising them, but the kink kicks in um, like in March, uh, March 2023, which isn't that far away. Um, and bunds have never been averted. They are now. Um, even the inversions that have happened in the past, which are rare, uh, have not been as steeply inverted as they are now. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's going to get the memo, they're going to cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying no, 
this is bad and it's going to get worse and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business uh, heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, is a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I don't want material adverse clauses. Clause, the average change clause is kicking in and said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits and the bankers go, huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then, then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards. They stop doing loss. And then interest rates will start to come down. But the interest rates peak after the recession be, has already begun. So it's not, so interest rates may not have peaked yet. I mean, um, even, you know, even the treasure market. So that's not unusual. Jim Rickards believes that we are in a triple greatest bubble of all time that includes real estate, stocks, and other asset classes. The bond market is telling a completely different story and indicating that we might be headed for a recession. This is the best single indicator of a recession. And the last time we saw anything like this, was 2007, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. The stock market believes that it's a Goldilocks soft landing, but the bond market is saying that it's going to get worse, and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. So, uh, so stock market's telling us Goldilocks, bond market's telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. Um, and then uh, there's what I call the reality. The standard definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. There are a few more bells and whistles having to do with unemployment and, and a few other things, but that's that's the rule of thumb. So based on that, and based on the best available estimate for a second quarter, likely to be accurate, we're in a recession today. Now, it's not severe, but that's like saying I got, I'm in bed with a you know pneumonia, but I'm not dying. Well, okay, but uh, we're in a, we're in a recession right now. The Fed's doing what they're doing, right or wrong. Okay, they're they're doing what they're doing. The market has their own interpretation. I agree with the market, certainly the bond market, that the Fed has probably over tightened. That means they're going to make it worse. They're going to make the recession even worse. In other words, if the Fed cuts rates, which they may, the pivot may be real. It's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. I mean, the Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the stock market level. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. What do you think about this video? Comment down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Nifty Invest. We'll see you in the next video. Hey guys, welcome back to Nifty Invest. In this video, Jim Rickards discusses the relationship between interest rates and the business cycle and the different indicators that suggest an economic downturn may be on the horizon. He notes that interest rates are a lagging indicator and that business owners, entrepreneurs, and medium-sized businesses are often the first to notice when a recession is imminent. He also points out that while the stock market is predicting a soft landing, the bond market is signaling that a recession is coming and that the inversion of yield curves is a particularly worrisome indicator. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. The uh, interest rates are a lagging indicator. Everyone's like, well, how could interest rates be um, you know, going up if we're in a recession? The answer is, um, as you get close to recession, who who figures it out first? Well, the Fed figures it out last. They're usually the last to know. Wall Street is second last to know. The people who figure it out first are actual business people, entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, dry cleaners, taxi drivers, 
um, or even medium-sized businesses, um, they see it. Uh, uh, you know, if you're in the trucking business, it's it's real time. Uh, you know, if inventories are sky high and new orders are being slashed, you're not you're not moving anything by truck. Uh, so there are certain businesses that are concurrent. But the the stock market is saying, uh, yeah, the Fed's raising rates, inflation is coming down, but we think they're already at the terminal rate. But not only that, we think they're going to get the memo that that the Fed will figure that out uh, before they get to five and a quarter, before they raise rates in May, maybe even March. You know, maybe they're done. Um, and because of a recession, uh, this is these soft landing Goldilocks scenario where the market's right, the Fed's wrong, but the Fed will realize that the market's actually right and cut rates, you know, and if you're going to cut rates, buy stocks. That's like Wall, Wall Street always ends every analysis with buy stocks. If you listen to you know, Michael Berry, uh, Jeremy Grantham, uh, you know, Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they, they run, uh, you know, hundreds of billions uh, and uh, they're saying the same thing. So Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world, you know, 1929, US, 1989, Japan, 2000, dot-com stocks, you know, and, and many others. Um, and he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's a triple greatest bubble of all time, times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks, and, and other asset classes. So, uh, yeah, I do, uh, that, that is my view, but it's, it's shared by a number of other analysts. 1929, yeah, everyone was like, yeah, October, uh, I think uh, 18th or 19th, it was late October 1929, the stock market fell 22% in two days. It wasn't one day, it was, you know, it was like 12% one day, 11% the next day, so 23% over two days. But that wasn't the crash, I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. The, the, this, this Dow Jones fell 82%. From, from top to bottom. Now it took three years. It, it bottomed in uh, June 1932, uh, started in October 1929, so not quite three years, but uh, that fell 82%. And and that happened. So, uh, so yeah, we're down, uh, you know, NASDAQ's down, uh, I'll bounce back a little bit in recent days, down close to 30%, down the S&P down over 20%. We're in bear market territory, but that that's just the beginning. That's not what a full, bear market, full, you know, market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that I expect. Jim Rickards explains that interest rates are a lagging indicator and that people like to question how they could go up if we're in a recession. However, as we get closer to a recession, business people like entrepreneurs, restaurant owners, and taxi drivers are the ones who figure it out first, not the Federal Reserve or Wall Street. The stock market might say that the Federal Reserve is raising rates and inflation is coming down, but it might not be the case. The bond market is telling a completely different story, by the way, and, and this is a little more esoteric, uh, but uh, if you look at um, yield curves, look at the Treasury yield curve, Euro dollar futures yield curve, German bunds, they're all inverted. They're all inverted. Now, inversions happen, just meaning the longer term rate is lower than the short term rate. Now this is in the treasury yield curve. They're inverted from one month to 20 years. It's not like, you know, people are talking twos and fives and fives and tens and all One month, one, a one month bill is yielding more than a 20 year note. Okay, that's inverted across the entire yield curve. Um, the Euro dollar future, same thing. The inversion kicks in. Uh, it doesn't kick in immediately because the Fed does control very short term rates and they're raising them, but the kink kicks in um, like in March, uh, March 2023, which isn't that far away. Um, and bunds have never been averted. They are now. Um, even the inversions that have happened in the past, which are rare, uh, have not been as steeply inverted as they are now. We're seeing something globally we've never seen before. And it is the best single indicator of a recession. The last time we saw anything like this was uh, 2007, uh, just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. So the stock market's saying it's all good, Goldilocks, soft landing, Fed's going to get the memo, they're going to cut rates, the pivot, and buy stocks. The bond market is saying no, this is bad, and it's going to get worse, and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. 
But as far as banking and credit is concerned, what happens is if you're a business person and you see business uh, heading down, you know, fewer customers, whatever, you go out and borrow all you can. You're like, hey, is a really bad recession coming. I better, if I got lines of credit, I'm going to use them up now. I don't want my bank changing the terms. I don't want material adverse clause. Clause, average change clause is kicking in and said, I'm going to borrow everything I can. And that creates a demand for funds and interest rates go up. And then the recession hits and the bankers go, huh, what's going on? Credit losses start going up. And then then they just turn off the spigots and they raise standards. They stop doing loss. And then interest rates will start to come down. But the interest rates peak after the recession be, has already begun so it's not so interest rates may not have peaked yet i mean um even you know even the treasury market so that's not unusual jim rickards believes that we are in a triple greatest bubble of all time that includes real estate stocks and other asset classes the bond market is telling a completely different story and indicating that we might be headed for a recession this is the best single indicator of a recession and the last time we saw anything like this was 2007 just ahead of the 2008 financial catastrophe. The stock market believes that it's a Goldilocks soft landing, but the bond market is saying that it's going to get worse, and it's actually too late for the Fed to do anything about it. So, uh, so stock market is telling us Goldilocks, bond market is telling us, you know, here comes, uh, you know, Hurricane Mitch or whatever. Um, and then uh, there's what I call the reality. The standard definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. There are a few more bells and whistles having to do with unemployment and, and a few other things, but that's that's the rule of thumb. So based on that, and based on the best available estimate for a second quarter likely to be accurate, we're in a recession today. Now, it's not severe, but that's like saying I got, I'm in bed with a you know pneumonia, but I'm not dying. Well, okay, but uh, we're in a, we're in a recession right now. The Fed's doing what they're doing right or wrong okay they're they're doing what they're doing the market has their own interpretation i agree with the market certainly the bond market that the fed has probably over tightened that means they're going to make it worse they're going to make the recession even worse in other words if the fed cuts rates which they may the pivot may be real it's not because they engineered a soft landing and Goldilocks and everything. Oh, that's just right. It's because they screwed up as usual as they've been doing since 1913. And we've seen this movie before. This is exactly what happened in 2018. I mean, the Fed was tightening into that collapse. The Fed tightened on uh, December 16th, 2018, only like eight days before the Christmas Eve massacre. And after most of the 20% collapse had already happened, they tightened one last time. So what it shows you is that when the Fed's on a mission, they they actually don't care about the stock market, this whole, you know, Bernanke put and Greenspan put and all that. That's not how it works. Uh, they don't care that much about the stock market level. Here's what they do care about. They care about disorderly markets. What do you think about this video? Comment down below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Nifty Invest. We'll see you in the next video.